Mustafa. So I have an idea, um, I mentioned in the first video about actually building a website, but I want to take you guys on the journey of my thought process and it's not going to be any simple website. So the front end needs to be very simple from the outside, but internally we want um, some niche microservice architecture that powers the whole thing. Um, and we want to be able to decouple all the pieces of the website. So think about like the front end, which is the user interface people interact with. The idea is we want to be able to scale the front end um, separately to the back end. So the back end is like when people click on the click on the components of the site, um, the, the front end makes like calls uh, transactions to the back end. So we want to make sure we can we can scale up the back end separately to the front end. The other thing is we're also going to need some storage. Um, to some kind of database where the back end can store stuff like user information, login information, um, product information, whatever the website's going to do. But the back end will make a lot of calls to the database and we don't want that to become the bottleneck either. So what we will do is build some sort of caching, um, in-memory caching. So the, the back end makes least amount of calls to to this um, to the database and database also has to be scalable so we're going to look at some kind of storage mechanism that can scale what we want to do as well is um, choose the right cloud provider and the, the cloud provider needs to be able to run containers we, we're going to shove all these components into little docker containers and the beauty about that is if you're new to docker it's basically like a treat every component as its own little um, virtual linux instance not, not a virtual machine, but more like an instance. And they can scale separately. They start it very quick. They build um, pretty quick. So we're gonna go through all of that. Um, my thinking is to have the front end obviously done in HTML and JavaScript. And what I wanna do is bundle it up into a minified sort of script and power, probably run it in Nginx. Nginx is really good at serving static files. Um, I'm very new to, to front-end development, so I don't have much um, Angular and React experience, so this is going to be a good, a good test um, and a good learning curve to, to go through all the front-end stack. And then the back-end stack, obviously I'm going to do that in Golang, which is my favorite for building microservices. And I'm thinking probably the caching would be a Redis instance. Um, and then I have no idea about the database, so we're going to explore that separately as well. Without further ado, let's look at some of the cloud providers. <laughs> Hello? Okay, so we've established we want to run a, uh, a website. We want to build a website, deploy it to the cloud. Um, but the main requirement is we want to run everything as microservices and we want to um, have a loosely coupled distributed architecture and everything needs to be run inside containers so our go-to platform is going to be Kubernetes so we're going to explore the cloud um, look for the top 10 cloud providers and I'm going to break them down into the most cost-effective solution for us um, but first we're going to need to find a banger so without further ado
been digging at some Kubernetes options for deployment options for the cloud and it looks like we're going to need to match these minimum requirements so there's a site for Kubler that is pretty cool um, they actually tell us what we need for the worker node so according to Kubler specs we need minimum uh, half a core and um, one gigabyte of RAM now those of you not familiar with Kubernetes um, basically Kubernetes is going to run all our containers it's going to run our whole architecture um, Kubernetes is a cluster so it has master nodes that take care of the worker nodes and they basically take care of scheduling and health checking and things like that um, helps to manage the cluster now in our case we don't want to manage um, the master nodes so we're going to look for a cloud provider that has that manages the masters on our behalf and hopefully we don't have to pay for the masters and we're going to look to squeeze our architecture into um, the minimum requirements spec but we're going to go slightly higher so um, my thinking is we're going to go with like a two core machine and probably about three to four gigs of ram so we're going to look for a cloud provider um, that can do all of this for us right so if you're not familiar with Kubernetes, fear not, because um, you're going to le learn a lot as we go. So subscribe and like this channel and uh, you'll learn some more. So we said we're going to find a cloud provider. So this is our cloud provider. And basically what Kubernetes does is there are two portions. There is the master nodes. And these are virtual machines. This is also known as the control plane. So this is where all the scheduling and the high availability and like the API server and all these things run. Now, technically in a managed environment, you should not have to worry about these. What you're worried about is the number of workers. So worker nodes is where the containers and the architecture is gonna run. So we're looking for um, a single worker. And this is where our Docker containers will run. So how many ever Docker containers we have, um, we're gonna build a website. So website will run here. Um, we may have a proxy, so there might be a proxy running, and we have a backend, and there might be a backend running. So three containers um, will run in there, and the masters will take care of and make sure these containers are highly available. Now, because we only have one worker node, um, it is not that highly available. So um, if we were in a more of an enterprise world where business critical uh, machines would run, we would create another worker node. Kubernetes will then make sure it schedules these containers evenly and distributes them and maybe you can run more than one copy to make sure if one machine dies you still have traffic going to your worker node so what we're focusing on is this piece here um, we're going to look for a cloud provider where this equals free sorry you can't see that free so we don't want to pay for the masters and there's a few other requirements so we're going to look at the specs for this machine um, we were I was thinking two CPU and probably four gigs of RAM and disk is also quite important I'm thinking about 80 gigabytes of disk and the reason for that is docker images can pile up and grow in size um, over time now the Kubernetes does take care of uh, making sure images get cleaned up, but I think 80 gigs will be roughly pretty cool. Um, now, the other thing is what we also need, and not this is not very clear in the Kubernetes world, is we're going to need a load balancer. It's not very clear in the in in the pricing. Um, some cloud providers include the load balancer as a price but normally when you ship Kubernetes there is no load balancer for the worker nodes um, the masters have load balancers but um, it's not managed by us so 
Um, that's not what we're going to be seeing. So we need a load balancer because we need customer will be talking to the load balancer when our website launches and traffic needs to go to the worker node. And that's how traffic's going to route to our container. And as I said earlier, um, default Kubernetes, you don't get a load balancer. So some cloud providers will charge you an extra $10 or some up to $30, $40 per month for a load balancer. So make sure we tick this one. We need a load balancer. And additionally, you're going to need a static IP. So in front of the load balancer, we need a static IP because our DNS record, so we're going to need a DNS as well. Our DNS will be pointing, so our domain will be pointing to the static IP, and we don't want it to change. So we need to take into account the cost of the reserved IP, as well as the cost of the load balancer, and then we need to take um, care of the cost of the worker node. So that's our requirement. So I'm going to dig for um, cloud providers and see where we can find this the cheapest. <laughs> Okay, awesome. I got to show you guys this. So I've done my analysis and this is it. Um, pretty much Azure remains pretty competitive. The only thing is their instance cost is like average. The load balancer is free, what makes them, um, you know, come under the Google one, like Google load balancer is expensive. And I've been looking at the trend of people deploying websites, not um, heavy workloads, and they seem to be going for these micros and the small instances. But we can see here, still 45 is quite steep, 48 quite steep for 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 deploying a website. Now, if I compare with DigitalOcean, um, nothing can beat it. Now, I actually got these two green ones highlighted because I was doing looking at their droplets and which is there like VMs and these are the prices. Now this one is still quite steep over $40. Um, this is quite cool, the $10 one. What I actually did is I went onto their website and I spun up a Kubernetes cluster and they have this yellow option um, as part of their Kubernetes offering which is a $10 instance and obviously their load balancer cost will come into play there. So you're looking at $27.95 Australian for a website. So if you're in the US it's even cheaper. Um, so this is this is awesome, uh, and I want to show you guys how easy it is to deploy a Kubernetes cluster on DigitalOcean. So when I go here, I just say create Kubernetes cluster. I pick my region and the version, and I say I want one node. I give it a name, and I say create. How easy is that? And I go to nodes. The user interface is so awesome. They like show you this, and you can click and see each of the agents provisioning. Um, there's recycle options. They give you the total cost here that it's um, for that cluster. And I think when you spin up a load balancer, you'll see the price come in here. There's some API documents and tutorials. You can download your Kubernetes config file here to start working. And um, you've got settings, which you can destroy the cluster. So this process takes roughly like five minutes, probably slightly less. Just waits for that bar to run across the screen and then it's done. It's, it's so easy. So yeah, I guess we have a winner. Um, this is the one I'll be using. 
and um, I'll be using it throughout our journey. Okay, so after all of that, we've um, finally decided we're going to deploy this architecture to DigitalOcean. So we've got a OneNote cluster going. Um, I want to take you guys along the journey. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to open source the entire architecture. So um, you guys can follow along if you're new to development, if you're new to operations, um, you're going to be learning a lot. So yeah, like and subscribe. And let me know down in the comments what specific technologies you want me to unbox during this process and we'll do it. Peace.